Hi everyone, welcome to Historically Speaking, an online YouTube history channel focused on the history of various institutions and professionals, how history intersects with these um, fields, including education and culture and the world around us. I'm Karen Yang, host of Historically Speaking, and today I'm here with Mark Lawrence, the director of the LBJ Presidential Library. Um, Mark Lawrence is the director and um, he has a lot of association, he has a lot of really great experience in history and in teaching and in publishing. And I'm really excited to speak with him today about the LBJ Presidential Library. Um, to give you guys some more background on the LBJ Presidential Library, uh, the mission of the LBJ Presidential Library is to really preserve and protect the historical materials and the collections of this library and make them really accessible to increase public awareness of the American experience through any relevant exhibitions and educational programs and to really showcase um, President Johnson's really unique impact and legacy on American history and American culture today. And it's been a great center for intellectual activity and community leadership and um, it's just been a really great institution that I really want to learn more about. Um, so I'm really beyond pleased today to have um, Mark here with us today. Thank you so much for joining us. Is there anything else you'd like to add about the bio or anything else you'd like to talk about when introducing yourself or anything else like that? No, I'll just say it's a pleasure to be with you, Karen. Um, thank you very much for having me. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, so I have a couple of questions today prepared around kind of just President Johnson's legacy and how we can kind of use um, the library to kind of learn more about him and learn how um, the lo a lot of the really amazing lessons that history has to teach us um, will apply to today. So I'll just dive right into the questions. Um, so what, how, what do you think um, has made President Johnson's administration relevant or enduring to our time period today? Or why does his time in office feel so relevant or um, have so many lessons that we can really learn from? Sure. Um, you know, I think LBJ's presidency continues to shape life in America in the 21st century in really profound ways. I often say that the two most consequential presidencies, in my opinion, at least since 1945, were those of Lyndon Johnson and Ronald Reagan, who were ideologically and politically in very different places on the American mm -hmm. spectrum. Mm -hmm. But a lot of political debate to this day really, I think, revolves around the, the intellectual positions that LBJ established at the liberals, on the liberal side and Ronald Reagan established on the um, conservative side. Mm -hmm. And we're still essentially having the same debate. So LBJ stands out as that figure, I think, who um, conceived of a liberal brand of politics, that is to say, mm -hmm. using the power and wherewithal and resources of the of government generally, but the federal government in particular, mm -hmm. to bring about reform in the lives of ordinary Americans. And so um, acting on that underlying approach to politics, mm -hmm. you know, LBJ was an enormously productive president who brought to us not only profound changes in the realms in the realm of civil rights through the 1964 Civil Rights Act and the 1965 Voting Rights Act, mm -hmm. but also through a whole array of other initiatives that go by the the name the Great Society. So mm -hmm. um, the the uh, all sorts of anti uh, poverty programs, federal support for education at every level, um, environmental regulation, consumer protection, uh, immigration reform, um, mm -hmm. uh, criminal justice and legal reform, um, the establishment of the National Endowment for the Arts, National Endowment for the Humanities, public broadcasting, all of these programs, and there are more, mm -hmm. date from the, the Johnson presidency. Mm hmm. A hundred percent. I think um, this is actually a great time for me personally to learn more about the library. Um, as in my AP United States history class, we kind of like very recently discussed um, President Reagan. And I definitely really liked how you talked about the kind of importance or like their really unique impact on how we think of politics and how we kind of define um, the different, like how liberal a program is or how like liberal a political party may be due to these two individual figures. 
Um, and I think that's really interesting to see that these presidents have a lot of impact on not only America as a whole, but also the American political like landscape. Um, I also think definitely, as you said, a lot of the very modern day programs that we know and love, such as all of these great national endowment um, for the humanities and for the arts comes from this time period. And I think that a lot of us don't personally think that, oh, like, at least kids my age might not exactly know that a lot of these great programs date from this time period. So I think that these programs are really evident of all the great work that President Johnson has done. Um, and that continues to kind of really impact us on a really monumental scale for sure. Yeah. And honestly, I didn't even mention Medicare and Medicaid. One hundred percent. I think very like most when, important. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Like when I was learning about the Great Society program, I think I was first kind of off put by the sheer amount of programs there were in both like the welfare kind of side of things with also the Medicaid and the Medicare side of things. But eventually when I was kind of learning it as a whole, I was just like, wow, this is very representative of President Johnson's like legacy and his own viewpoints. And I think that's really interesting to see that it really still impacts us today so much. Sure, sure, absolutely. Um, uh, you know, LBJ, of course, didn't do it all by himself. And mm -hmm. one of the reasons he was so successful is that he was president during a political era when large parts of the American public were very much behind this kind of approach to government and this kind of this kind of approach to creation of opportunity and social mobility. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, a lot of that went away um, in the 70s, particularly in the 80s and, and beyond. But I think LBJ still stands as the um, embodiment of that approach to politics that still has a lot of appeal, I think, to many Americans, even mm -hmm. as we've grown more skeptical of the ability of government to bring about meaningful reform at a reasonable cost. Yes, 100%. I think, as you said, he was kind of president during like a very, um, like a very I would say like optimal time for his own agenda and for his own policies um, and that there was a lot of civil rights movement um, change occurring as well and it kind of really joined and meshed together with his own personal and political um, ideology so that was definitely a very like optimal time for him to be president and to push um, certain pieces of legislation through for sure. Um, I guess this kind of leads on to the next question, and I think we've also kind of covered a little bit about it, um, but what do you think has been the most enduring part of President Johnson's legacy? Um, well, I th that, that's a tough one because there mm -hmm. are so many. Um, I'm you know, for many Americans, and this may be something we would want to talk about, it's the Vietnam War, which... Mm -hmm. I think has tended to shroud a lot of the accomplishments that come from the Johnson period. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And it's one of the reasons why we forget, you know, so many of the major accomplishments of the Johnson presidency. But I think the simplest answer and, and the, the answer is certainly I would offer most enthusiastically is civil rights. I mean, mm -hmm. this, this, this was the presidency that moved on civil rights in a very meaningful way for the first time in a hundred years since the civil war mm -hmm. and the transformative effect of the civil rights act of 1964 and the voting rights act of 1965 and the lesser known fair housing act of 1968 was mm -hmm. you know it's 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 hard to capture just how enormous you know uh, the the implications of these measures were um, and mm -hmm. I think in many ways, you know, we live in a America to this day, which of course still has its controversies and tensions over these issues, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. the debate is largely taking place in a context that was shaped by these legislative accomplishments from the mid 1960s. A hundred percent. I definitely agree. I think um, first, I really agree with the fact that a lot of people feel that the Vietnam War kind of is his kind of most enduring part of his legacy or the fact that once we think of President Johnson, we think of, oh, a lot of these foreign affairs and a lot of his reactions to these foreign affairs, while um, all of the kind of domestic issues that he was also tackling really particularly affect us as Americans in today's day and age as well. I definitely agree that all of these civil rights legislation, um, we see a lot of it again in today's world. And 
um, as you said, with a hundred years of just legislation that was just not getting passed, his decision to really streamline that and to really put that into the forefront of American issues was definitely very noteworthy. Um, I just remember learning about it and just seeing that, oh, President Kennedy did want to include some of this very civil rights-based legislation, um, but it was kind of President Johnson who really took that initiative to really bring it to the forefront and to really make sure that we were talking about this and thinking about this and um, still talk and think about it to this day as well. For sure. Um, here's another question, I guess, about how we can kind of learn from uh, the mistakes of the President Johnson's administration or kind of learn from some of the shortcomings. Um, what lessons do you think we can learn from President Johnson's administration and how can we kind of apply that to today's culture or political landscape or just national no. um, environment as a whole? Yeah, um, you know, I think LBJ was first and foremost a political pragmatist. Mm -hmm. um, he was someone who was able to adapt across his very long political career to mm -hmm. assume different positions on the political spectrum, support different kinds of policies as the political environment in the United States changed. Um, he wasn't particularly committed, I think, to any particular ideological vision. Um, and this is something I think that is you know, I, I would argue sort of sadly lacking from American politics in the 21st century where a practical pragmatic approach to politics is almost nowhere to be seen. And mm -hmm. everybody is dug in mm -hmm. on a, um, an ideological position that they passionately believe in, right? Mm -hmm. And so what we've seen is, is polarization and mm -hmm. the almost impossibility of bipartisan cooperation and coalitions um, even as the country's needs are uh, continue to grow and grow and grow. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, LBJ was very successful at creating um, bipartisan coalitions. Mm -hmm. you know, for example, the, the, important civil, the most important civil rights legislation that we were just talking about, mm -hmm. these were passed with, uh, as a percentage of their seats in Congress, a higher proportion of Republican votes than Democratic votes, right? Oh, wow. So LBJ was a, a master of building these kinds of coalitions. Now, he, I, I think it's fair to say he was very good at that, but the political context was also, of course, very different. And so it's not really fair to Joe Biden or Barack Obama or even Donald Trump, for that matter, to criticize them for not being able to create bipartisan coalitions. Mm -hmm. I mean, Congress and the American public is so different now from what it was in the late 1950s and through the 1960s that that's a, an easy thing to say but ignores a lot of really um really uh you know profound change in american politics but you know we still have to give lbj i think his due he was very effective at um recognizing opportunities to get his legislation passed um, on the strength of cobbling together coalitions of people who at first glance might not have had much in common with each other. Mm -hmm, for sure. I think um, when I was learning about President Johnson, um, there was this like on the textbook, there was just like this little caption and this picture of just President Johnson kind of working like the Johnson effect kind of thing with um, him just like very just like I remember reading some other senators comment on his kind of technique of just like being able to connect, being able to kind of intimidate, being able to just persuade all of these different um, people to come together and agree on certain ideas or certain pieces of legislation. I definitely think that, um, as you said, like today's context is so different compared to um, just even 50, 60 years ago um, in that we are definitely a lot more polarized in the things that we believe. And it seems that we are more adamant about sticking to certain core beliefs, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. Um, but I definitely agree that we can see a lot of um, things from President Johnson that really worked in terms of coming together, maybe laying aside some other differences in order to really compromise and create legislation that will be more beneficial to a lot more people as a whole. Um, so I definitely think that maybe trying to not necessarily emulate the Johnson effect, but rather trying to kind of utilize a kind of idea and that kind of mindset and try to see how we can adopt that to today's society would be definitely very helpful for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, one last question about kind of the LBJ presidential library as a whole. 
Um, so how can the general public, I guess, use the LBJ Presidential Library to learn more about President Johnson's legacy? Um, and how can they just kind of explore um, the LBJ Presidential Library um, to learn more about some of the topics we talked about today? Sure. Um, well, the simplest answer to that question is come to Austin, Texas and uh, come visit our museum, work, you know, come and do research in our research room, uh, take part in our programs. But I understand that uh, not everyone can can easily do that. A wonderful place to visit, though Austin may be. Um, and we, in, we increasingly have put a lot of our programs and museum exhibits and archival resources online. Now, this is a, a long-term project. Um, and, you know, to this point, we've only been partially successful in putting uh, our assets into a virtual um, you know, digital uh, format so that people can access them from anywhere. But we are making serious headway. So I'd urge people to take a look at our website, not only lbjlibrary.org, but also something called discoverlbj.org. Mm -hmm. um, lbjlibrary.org is our basic, you know, website that introduces people to the library and all that it holds. Discover LBJ is um, a, a separate website that collects digitized uh, documents from the archival collection. Now we have 45 million pages of documents in the LBJ library and only a very small fraction have been digitized to this point. But some of the most interesting and heavily used collections have been digitized and are available through this website. So I think uh, that would be a resource that I would definitely um, urge people to take a look at. Mm -hmm. uh, but as I say, a lot of our public programs with very high profile speakers, uh, our education programs that are aimed both at students and also at teachers are also available online. Mm -hmm. Awesome. I think definitely with like um, the pandemic's kind of pivot to everything online, I see more and more institutions kind of catering um, their awesome resources online as well. And I think that that's definitely very innovative and definitely very interesting and um, becomes even more applicable to students my age who are all very internet obsessed, I guess, um, but can still really learn and access a lot of these great resources on the go or just make them more accessible. And I think that's really, really great. And um, I really just urge everyone to check out the Presidential Library as well. Um, that kind of wraps up everything today. Is there anything else you'd like to add or anything else you'd like to say um, about the LBJ Presidential Library or any of the other really interesting topics that we talked about today? No, well, I suppose only to um, echo your point that the pandemic had a significant silver lining for institutions like the LBJ Library. It really, I think, accelerated our knowledge of and ability to use virtual possibilities. And so it's been um, a, uh, a, a, it's really pushed what no doubt would have been a long-term process forward very, very abruptly. And we've learned mm -hmm. a lot about how to do that. Nevertheless, I would still say um, the best way to experience the LBJ library, or frankly, any other museum or archive is to go and take part in person, flip the pages of the archival collections in mm -hmm. person, because I think something is lost by doing it virtually. So I would make an appeal to maybe younger generations that are so technologically adept, nevertheless, to go and uh, to hold the documents in your hands and see the artifacts face to face, if, mm -hmm. you know, if and when that becomes possible for you here in Austin or anywhere you go across the country. Mm -hmm. 100%. I think um, a lot of history for me personally is encountering it in my daily life or encountering it kind of in person, because I think it makes it much more tangible and you can see and feel a lot of a lot more of those effects um, of just maybe his legacy or um, I guess you can just kind of see a lot of things in person really enables you to understand them better or grow an appreciation for them more. So um, I definitely think in-person visits to any institution, including the LBJ Presidential Library, is definitely very worthwhile. And um, I really hope to personally also um, visit Austin, Texas sometime soon and take a look as well. Um, and with that, if there's nothing else you'd like to add, that's pretty much all there is for today. Um, thank you for everyone for watching and for listening, and I'll see you in the next interview.